Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, the Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, the grant maker and grant seekers relationship, what we know and how we can strengthen it. This program is part of a new joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted, Stronger Relationships, Greater Impact, which we la launched on March 15th. Today we'll be able to hear a conversation between Jewish Theological Seminary Professor Jack Wertheimer and Dina Fuchs, Executive Director of Micah Philanthropies and former Executive Vice President of JFN. They will discuss Jack's report on grantees and their funders, which shows what professionals at Jewish nonprofits experience while working with funders. This report and its findings and recommendations show the needs and help to build what we now call Granted. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one and facilitated conversations, Granted offers a wide range of tools, articles, case studies, and other resources on its, on its website, www.jgranted.org. And now we'll go to the next slide. As I said, Granted is, uh, Granted is a joint project of Jewish Funders Network and Upstart with Jewish Upframing from Hadar. It works to strengthen relationships between grant makers and grant seekers in the Jewish community. And why did we do this? We did this, as I mentioned before, because of it was inspired by the study that we're going to go into um, later today with the grantees and their funders, how professionals at Jewish nonprofits experience working with grant makers. Um, we learned a lot from this that Jewish nonprofit leaders overall report report positive working relationships with funders, um, but a number shared some difficult experiences. And the how, how are we going to try to create the change we want to see? We will do this by offering monthly programs such as this one, facilitated conversations, and a resource hub. Our monthly programs. Our monthly programs, thank you. My monthly program will be running monthly programs such as this one. Um, to bring important topics um, to the community and create places to learn. Uh, our upcoming programs, will, one will be on May 27th about the impact of COVID uh, on grant makers and grant seeker relationships looking towards the future. And in June, we're gonna have an opportunity to learn about a self-assessment tool with exponent philanthropies. And we will have one each month and please look out on our website for more information. Our facility of the conversations, um, we welcome your participation with this. We plan to convene online and when possible in-person facilitated conversations between grant makers and grant seekers to explore some of the topics and themes featured on the site. If you're interested in participating in a facilitated conversation, please be in touch with Alana Rahmani at arahmani at jfunders.org or message us at www.jgranted.org. Our resource hub offers a wide selection of grand curated resources in a variety of modalities, such as articles, podcasts, toolkits, and case studies. We organized these around four core independent components of successful grant making, which we, um, we categorize as sustaining impact, relationship building, communication, and power dynamics. And granted is intended to be dynamic and interactive, and we welcome you to submit resources that you you would like to see it on the site via our comment box and please check the site frequently for updates and news, new resources and upcoming events. And I wanted to just give a little bit of color to um, the, the website. So you can go to www.jgranted.org and I'm just gonna take a, a moment or two because I know that we have more things that are more important. So I don't think I'm gonna go off script for what I was gonna say, but. Alana, if you can show us the next slide, this is welcome to grant it. I'll just show you a few slides um, so you know what you're gonna get into when you see it. So if you go to the website and you go to the, the homepage, you'll see welcome to grant it. So the next, thank you. So at the top of the homepage, you'll find those four main categories of resources that I mentioned before, sustaining impact relationship building, communication and power dynamics. And if we go on to the next slide, you'll see a screenshot of if you, when you select a category, I'm right here, I selected relationship building, you'll be taken to that resource page. And on the left-hand side, you will search by section and topic. Here we are viewing content related to communication and the grant pro process. The next um, 
snapshot I want to show you is that when you click on the resource, you'll be taken to a short blurb about the resource and a direct link. You also have the opportunity to rate um, the resource and give feedback. That's where some of the interactivity comes in and we would love to hear your thoughts. And I know more than us wanting to hear it, your, your colleagues and your fellow funders would want to hear from, from you what you think about the article and what you learned from it. After that, you can see that we encourage you to provide feedback. Um, as I mentioned, um, at the bottom of the homepage, you will also can provide comments uh, and submit resources for consideration on the site. And then at the bottom of our homepage, you can also join our email list to stay updated about our workshops, facilitated program, and other updates. Um, and so please let us know what you're thinking. Get it. Let us give us your comments. Okay, so ha, huh, I know that was very quick, um, but I hope you got a little taste for what is currently being offered and for our hopes to continue to bring resources to you. So, but now I want to um, I want to introduce Dina Fuchs to start our program today and and get really into the content. So thank you, Dina, and thank you, Jack. We're looking forward to hearing this, this presentation. Great, thanks so much, Tamar. Um, I just wanted to, to start by thanking Tamar, thanking JFN, um, and thanking the JFN team who worked so um, intently on Granted, including Alana and Joey Wiener, um, and amazing partners in Upstart, um, led by Aliza Mazur. Um, this is an incredible partnership in putting together this Granted project. Um, so I am enormously um, um, gratified to be able to speak on this panel with Jack. Um, I just want to take you through uh, sort of a, my, my journey with Granted. Um, it started actually when I was still at the Avi Clive Foundation. I was um, Senior Director of Strategy and Partnerships um, and worked very closely with Jack on our Knowledge Center, on our Knowledge Management. Jack, I think we actually worked together on 10 reports. I went back to look. Um, it's really amazing. We've done ton, 10 projects together, this being our last one. Um, and the world has uh, sellers. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I, from what I hear, it, it has benefited the field to some extent. So thank you for all of the work you, you put into that. Um, and so I then, when I moved over to JFN, um, actually took the report with me. Um, at, with a, a generous grant from the Avi Clive Foundation to develop Granted. Um, and um, spent the last oh, more than a year working with the JFN team and the Upstart team to pull this project together. It's been an enormously positive experience an incredible partnership, as I mentioned. Um, and now I'm uh, back to the grant making side as uh, the executive director of Michael Philanthropies. And I'm working with some very, very thoughtful funders who are so um, intent on developing strong um, relationships um, with our, you know, with our grant seekers, those who are executing on a vision and mission um, so that we can have greater impact. So I'm, you know, I've seen this project from beginning to end and I'm enormously excited to benefit from it in my work going forward. Um, and I just wanted to quickly turn this over um, to Jack, um, who I think everybody knows Jack is, but I'll, you know, out of a vote, I just want to share. Um, Jack is Professor of American Jewish History at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He writes about developments in the American Jewish religious communal educational and film about, I'm sorry, developments in American Jewish religious communal educational and philanthropic life since 1945. He's the author and editor of over a dozen books, most recently, The New American Judaism, How Jews Practice Their Religion Today, and of course, 10 Projects. Um, and I just want to get a, just one like memory as we're going into this work together, Jack, and I, I'd love for you to reflect on sort of the genesis of this project. But I remember sitting in uh, at a meeting with, um, with you, um, Yossi Prager, um, and Andres Fakoini, and we were talking about the, re the report before this one, which was called Giving Jewish, How Big Jewish Funders Have Transformed American Jewish Philanthropy. We published it in 2018. And it was really a, sort of an investigation into how private philanthropy was shaping the Jewish community. Um, and I remember Andres, you know, sort of putting on the table this question about, you know, wouldn't it be helpful for us to understand how the nonprofit community views these changes? And that was the, sort of the impetus for this work together. Um, and I'd just love if you could share your, you know, sort of your thoughts about the genesis. In particular, I'm really curious to hear from you how was the, the research received? You know, when you ran out into the field to talk with all of these stakeholders, curious what kind of reaction you got from the nonprofit community. So, Jack. 
Great, yes. So, so to begin with, uh, I just wanna uh, say how uh, much of a pleasure it is to have the opportunity to interact with you, Dina. We've had a very long relationship of over 20 years um, when we were colleagues at the, uh, at the Avi High Foundation. Um, and I'm also glad that you raised the point about Andres because he really initiated uh, this, this project um, in the meeting that you just described now. Um, so um, what I wanna begin by saying is this is a very human story. Um, and um, I, as Dina has indicated, I've, I've worked on quite a number of projects. This one has been particularly fascinating to me because of that human dimension. Uh, it's a story about uh, enormous amounts of altruism um, and also in some cases of, um, of tensions uh, due to uh, the imbalance in power relationships. Uh, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. But as to your question most directly, what I would say is that um, um, uh, there were 140 people, uh, professionals, who were uh, at, at Jewish not-for-profits who were interviewed for this project. Uh, I did have an assistant uh, who interviewed roughly 35 or 40 uh, of those people. I interviewed the rest. And both of us uh, experienced um, a, um, a warmth and an appreciation for the fact that we're interested in hearing what their experiences have been. Um, I can only recall one instance in which someone was really very guarded, um, but what was very clear was that we were asking questions that people were eager to speak about, particularly because they were guaranteed anonymity. And the report does not name any names, and it tries very hard to shield the identities of people who are quoted uh, throughout the report. Um, and uh, that was necessary because of what I just said before. There is a power imbalance. There's a, 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 a nervousness, if you will, that um, I'm going to say something and that's going to hurt me and especially my institution. Um, but um, it was quite clear, and we're going to get to this in a moment, that people, um, the these uh, professionals and not-for-profits were eager to speak about uh, very positive interactions that they had, the gratitude that they felt, um, and also in some cases to have the opportunity to get some things off their chests that had been uh, bothering them for a period of time. Okay, great. Thanks, Jack. Um, so I, I think, you know, human nature tends to focus on the negative or, you know, sort of the mosaic challenge, right? You always see the missing piece. Um, but um, we really, it's, it's important um, for us to recognize that the bulk of this conversation will be focused on what needs to be improved and sort of areas where we can grow. Um, but that does not um, mean that the negative outweigh the positive in this report. Um, again, we'll look for that, but I just, I feel like it's important to just say it out loud um, and very explicitly that there is, there's a lot of positive. And so before we get to the, the meat of this conversation, focusing on you know, where we can do better, um, I'd love if you can sort of just sort of honor, highlight, lift up some of the positive things that we heard, um, and then we'll move on, on to the rest of the conversation. Yes, yeah, I, I, would, I would just reiterate what you said. Uh, even, even some of the people who are most critical about some aspects of their relationship with funders um, made a point of saying that that, well, that was not the, the general case um, and that they had very positive relationships with other funders. Um, and um, more generally, what I would say is that, of course, they were grantees who very much appreciated the funding that they received. Um, they need that in order to sustain uh, their, their institutions and to run their programs. But beyond the, the funding uh, that they received, they also expressed appreciation for the friendships that they uh, were able to build. And in some cases they talked uh, at great length about sharing happy occasions with their funders, and in some cases, sorrowful ones, um, that there were real relationships uh, that ha had been built up. They talked uh, about cases of, of uh, enormous altruism uh, of funders, for example, um, who uh, came out of the woodwork to support uh, efforts when they when the, they, the funders, felt that there was a crisis. And by the way, uh, this was especially the case in what I want to touch upon in my comments today also, namely what has happened during COVID, uh, because I have done some follow-up research since this report, and I learned quite a bit about 
funders who had not been particularly active in the past in terms of supporting agencies, and they stepped up because they felt that those agencies could deliver uh, for them. But also they spoke about the, the advice freely given uh, by, by funders. Uh, and we'll talk about how the advice sometimes can be problematic, but they talked about very, very constructive advice that they were given. They talked about how funders were uh, gracious in introducing them, that is the professionals, uh, to other funders and how helpful that was as well. Um, I could add to this list, but I do want to reiterate the point that um, there is much that I heard that was quite positive and that should not get uh, overlooked as we do focus on some of the more critical issues that were raised. Okay, fantastic, thanks. And I, I would just say that the granted project actually highlights a number of um, really great partnerships um, along the four, the four pillars that Tamar described. Um, and you know, what I think we should really think about is sort of what's working, who's, who's working well, and how can we model some of those behaviors, so thanks. Um, and I'll just tell you from my perspective, you know, um, when I was um, um, at JFN, I, I, I so appreciated um, getting advice from, from my, um, you know, so the grant makers who are involved with JFN who had really particular expertise and really helped me think through um, challenges I was having them or seeking opportunities that I didn't necessarily recognize right away. Um, but on the other side, I will say there were some conversations I had that were really difficult, right? Um, you know, criticism that came not so nicely phrased or, you know, questioning my abilities and, and things along those lines. And so some of the you know, criticism that's not constructive. And those are the kinds of things that we're gonna, we're gonna unpack together. Um, okay, so, um, so I referenced human nature just a, a few minutes ago, um, sort of, you know, picking on what's not working. Um, but I also wanna um, acknowledge another element of human nature. Um, and that is that we often um, will read a positive story or an anecdote and we all see it as very familiar. Maybe we'll even see it as biographical. Um, and then when we see negative stories, we definitely think it's about somebody else, not about me. Um, and I, I'd also you know, like to put forward that there is a cognitive dissonance here. Like we are all involved in good work. We all wanna do our best. We all wanna do the best for the Jewish community, for the world. Um, and how is it possible that there is like, that we're doing something wrong within the context of doing so much good. Um, and so I want to just share a story that many, many of you may have heard already um, that might help put us into some of the right mindset um, to hear about where there's room for improvement. Um, and um, I'm going to keep it very brief because I want to focus on the actual content, but I just want to, you know, sort of set this sort of frame of reference. Um, so as I mentioned, I work with Jack on this report. Um, and like I did the nine reports before, and my responsibility um, was really to like, you know, read the interviews, read the first drafts, ask some probing questions, maybe do a little bit of editing, you know, sort of how to package the content in a way um, that might best, you know, be used by the field. Um, and I, I viewed this work just like that, right? I had been a, uh, I had worked at Avi Chai for 20 years and worked with a number of grantees, um, developed what I thought were really wonderful relationships, you know, sort of along the lines of what Jack was describing as sharing in good times and in bad times and, um, you know, helping with marketing, communications, knowledge sharing, all different, you know, um, skills that I brought to the table um, and, and, and particularly in a number of program design um, sort of ventures with grantees. Um, and so when I started reading this report, um, with you know a mind's eye that I was working to provide knowledge for the field, it never crossed my mind that this report would be for me. Um, and then I, it quickly <laughs> changed as I was reading when I turned the page and I saw um, an entry, an interview um, respondent was sort of explaining to Jack um, some frustration with a program um, that was run by some funders. And um, I realized it was a program that I had designed. So not only was this report not, not only for me, it was actually about me. Um, and that was really, really difficult. Um, and basically the complaint was is that there was this program that was designed that didn't necessarily align with the goals of the organizations in which we were trying to serve. Um, and um, my name certainly was not mentioned. Avichai was certainly not mentioned, um, but it was very clear. 
Um, and ironically, it was a project that was like a signature Avi Chai project, a project that we deemed to be enormously successful, scaled in many different versions. In fact, other funders modeled their programs after this one. Um, and um, I was I was quite, to be very honest, um, and embarrassingly, embarrassingly so, when I saw this, my first reaction was, wow, he really didn't get it, right? Like this, this nonprofit leader just did not understand what we were trying to do. Um, and, and then I, um, I switched gears and I, um, I realized, you know, sort of shame on me. Um, I didn't communicate our goals well enough. Um, I probably didn't check in with those involved to see if my, our goals were aligned with their goals and their needs. Um, and even more so, as, and I can say this upon reflection as I'm doing this work with Granted, you know, I didn't provide an opportunity for that kind of feedback. Um, working with grantees for so many years and yet that was not, um, it wasn't open enough that I could hear that the project we were doing was not, um, was not aligned. Um, and I had to read it about it in a report, you know, years later. So um, it was that moment that I realized I had to do better. And I also realized that I'm probably not the only one that needs to do better. So um, I'd like to just encourage us all to see ourselves in this discussion, even if you're not the subject matter of the, of the report, um, as someone who is a subject matter of the report, I would just you know, sort of encourage us to say, there's always room to grow. There's some things we need to learn and see even when it's hard and when it doesn't match up with the good feelings that we have about what we do. Um, so that's just sort of setting a mindset. Um, and Jack, so now I'm gonna turn it back to you. Um, if you can share some of the key takeaways from the research, um, and if I can ask you to add the layer that you referenced before, right, COVID, right? This report was written pre-COVID. Um, granted, it was developed during COVID. Um, and I know you've been doing more research. Um, so it would be great if you can provide what you learned, but with that COVID overlay. Um, I'm gonna hand it over. Great, yeah. Well, I think you touched upon something very important um, uh, that, that certainly did surface, and that has to do with, with communication and miscommunication. Um, and I, I don't want to reduce everything to that, um, but um, uh, there is a lot of, of miscommunication, miscommunication and misunderstanding um, that I came across. And when we talk about how some funders have responded to these criticisms, uh, we'll also see that there is a, a misalignment really um, uh, that, that leads to this kind of uh, misunderstanding. Um, look, so I'll give you a, a, perhaps a, a, some glaring examples. Um, there, uh, there were individuals who really spoke quite uh, strongly um, about their feeling that they had been jerked around by uh, professionals uh, at uh, foundations who had, um, in the view of these uh, not-for-profit leaders, led them on. Um, and in the process, uh, they, they uh, developed a series of uh, proposals, uh, rewrote those proposals, invested an enormous amount of time and personnel and other resources, costing them a lot of money and being, uh, and being uh, uh, pulled along um, because the, 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 the foundation uh, professional would not state very clearly, uh, is this gonna be a go or not? And then at the end of the day, it, it was rejected. Um, and it, of course, in some cases, they referred to hundreds of thousands of dollars that were spent not only in the time that was invested, uh, but in all kinds of other work that had to be done. So that's one example of, of something that was, uh, that was raised with some frequency and some vehemence uh, also. Um, the other, um, another type of issue that was raised uh, had to do with the, the heavy demands that uh, foundations and increasingly also individual funders were making uh, when it came to preparing for a grant proposal, writing the grant proposal, writing follow-up reports uh, about, the, about the grants. Uh, all of this was extremely time-consuming, extremely demanding. Um, uh, and then uh, in those cases where grant where grantors rather grant makers actually work together, they all they each had very different types of reporting requirements. So the issue that was being raised was that there's an, an inefficiency in the system of of developing uh, grants 
um, and making the case for those grants and then reporting as well. Um, and, and on this uh, score, uh, we do have evidence that during COVID, there were lots of foundations and other kinds of funders who, um, um, uh, were, who pressed far less for follow-up reports and, and uh, especially in highly detailed ones. Uh, and the question is whether um, that level of trust uh, will persist uh, post-COVID or will return to a previous period of time. And by the way, I, sh I just wanna add in this connection that what I've just described now is a standard complaint um, that people who work in the field of American philanthropy more generally uh, raise, uh, namely that uh, there's, uh, there's just too much work that's involved in trying to uh, develop a, a grant and then report uh, on that grant. Um, pardon me, I forgot to turn my phone off. Um, a third area that that uh, that uh, that arose uh, had to do with um, the um, the failure in some cases of foundations to appreciate that even failures, uh, programs that do not succeed to the level that uh, of expectation are not necessarily wasted opportunities, but rather that they're opportunities for learning. And that's something that also was not, uh, not necessarily appreciated according to these, um, uh, these um, um, professionals at not-for-profits. And then I'd add uh, perhaps one or two uh, additional types of, of issues. One that's a very sensitive one, and it varies, of course, by foundation, is whether uh, there is going to be any support for overhead. Um, that there are foundations that refuse to pay for overhead. And the argument of uh, professionals, particularly the top professionals at not-for-profits is that um, that overhead uh, costs um, help to pay for the staff that develops these grants in the first place, uh, the idea, the proposals that develops the ideas uh, that oversees the, the projects. Um, and that is, is something that, that makes it much more difficult than for these not-for-profits uh, to, uh, to function. Um, and um, I suppose the last issue that I wanna raise in this regard, um, which is a, a sensitive one, uh, is the um, repeated concern, if not anger, expressed by some of these professionals who've been in the field for decades um, that their expertise is not respected. Um, that um, they have, as I just said, worked in, in a field for many decades, and especially when they work with younger professionals who are working for foundations, those professionals are high-handed. They don't uh, show any respect or show little respect for the, that expertise. Uh, there's a lack of, of uh, cooperation, really, a lack of, of sense of collaboration, but that we know better. Um, and uh, this was perhaps one of the points that was most vehemently expressed, um, and so much so that one of the people I interviewed said, that she's had it with this and she's planning to retire because of it, retire early, that is because of it. Uh, and this again is something that's not unique to the field, uh, but there are programs that exist outside of the Jewish arena uh, pr precisely to help train younger professionals working at foundations to understand what their role is and what it's not uh, and how to interact uh, in a fair fashion um, with, uh, with uh, professionals and not-for-profits. And in this regard too, uh, what I heard both from uh, top professionals at foundations as well as from professionals at not-for-profits is that during COVID, in some areas, with some individuals, the level of respect and, and uh, for expertise has risen. Uh, there's more trust that people have on both sides of the table. Um, and that perhaps came out of the fact that there was so much more collaboration that occurred during the course of COVID. Um, and that raised the, uh, the esteem, if you will, and the profile of uh, professionals at, at not-for-profits in the eyes of, of foundation professionals and vice versa. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm remembering as you're speaking now, this is pretty harsh, you know, some of the things that you've just shared. Um, and I'm remembering as we were um, getting in the first initial drafts of the interviews um, that we felt the same way, right? Like there, there was an opportunity that we felt there was a need to let um, foundation CEOs sort of respond to some of the critique, um, that it wasn't a one-sided story. Um, and so we reached out to a number of CEOs um, and you've included some of their comments in the report as well. So I'm just wondering, Jack, if you can give us a little quick overview of sort of, you know, we heard the negative right now, and I'm just curious what kind of um, reaction you heard from. Yes, I think this is very important. Uh, and and I, I'd like our, those who are uh, watching this webinar to, to understand that this is not uh, a one-sided report. And uh, I, uh, the report contains some very lengthy uh, uh, quotations from uh, foundation CEOs who push back. And, and, uh, and that gets again to the heart of the question of communication. Um, what's, what these foundations professionals were saying was, yes, there are times in which it seems like we're stringing uh, a, um, a grant along, a grant proposal along, but that's because we're not sure whether it's going to fly with our board. And we try to work with people to improve their proposals, but there's no guarantee that the board will approve of it. And if uh, grantees are unhappy with that state of affairs, then they shouldn't apply. Uh, they shouldn't play along, but we, we just can't guarantee it. So that's one uh, argument that, that they made. Uh, a second one, which is really critical, is that there is a fundamental misunderstanding that exists uh, and perhaps intentionally so um, uh, uh, amongst uh, professionals at not-for-profits who are, after all, uh, primarily concerned about the sustaining their, their particular institutions, their organizations. They don't want to take no for an answer. Um, and so one of the things that was said is uh, one, one um, uh, CEO at a foundation said, you know, uh, my foundation uh, supported um, a particular organization over the period of a number of years, and then it was time for us to move on. And it's not that that organization did anything wrong, but we support change. We don't, our business is not sustaining institutions, but rather identifying um, uh, uh, providers, uh, organizations that can provide um, uh, new types of programs that will innovate and, uh, and, and if you will, create a, a new path for us. But uh, organization leaders whose grants have run out and have not been renewed are angry. Um, and sometimes they, they display that anger. Um, and uh, they don't perhaps understand or perhaps don't want to understand that the business of foundations is primarily, not necessarily exclusively, but primarily to fund innovation. And therefore they need to move on because they have limited amounts of funds that they can distribute and they can't keep on supporting uh, organizations and programs indefinitely. Um, and that that's an area where um, I think that better communication could help to make a difference, uh, but there are fundamentally different interests at work here, and that has to be recognized uh, also. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm just uh, going over my own list to see whether there's anything else I want to, to add to this. And one of the things, of course, that, that uh, some of these uh, CEOs at foundations have complained about is that, um, the, the effort on the part of professionals at not-for-profits to tailor, to shape their proposals in a way that will appeal to the funder. Now, on a certain level, that makes perfect sense, but sometimes it becomes absurd because they are, and I'm quoting one of these CEOs at a foundation now, they turn themselves into pretzels uh, in order to, to develop a proposal that they think will be uh, appreciated by, uh, by the, the, the foundation. And it's, uh, it's a proposal that has very little to do with the mission of the uh, organization uh, and that the organization has any particular strength in delivering. Um, one of the more humorous stories I was told was of a uh, professional and not-for-profit who uh, visited with the CEO of a foundation uh, and handed him 
um, uh, index, about 40 index cards and said to him, uh, you know, here are the things that we're interested in doing. You pick, you tell us which one you're interested in supporting, which is not exactly what foundations are interested in doing. Um, those are a few examples, but I, I do want to stress the point that, that there is a there are two sides to this story. The report stresses that. And I think it'll be critically important as Grant Ed, uh, continues that that's understood, that there are two sides to the story, Great. at least. Right. <laughs> um, so Jackie spoke a lot about foundations, staff foundations in particular. I'm wondering if you can sort of shed some light on, you know, individual funders and, and, and you know, what you've learned about that. Again, you know, positive, negative. Yes, yes. So one of the things that I learned is, is that, um, uh, and this is not earth shaking news, but it goes against what some uh, have argued, and that is that we're moving into a time in which um, uh, all funding is strategic um, and that it's not based necessarily on uh, a, a more subjective, if you will, desire to support a particular institution or even a particular individual uh, who's seen as a worthy leader. Um, and I heard so many stories about how that's just not the case, but when, particularly when it comes to individual funders. Individual funders do give from the heart. By the way, there are, there are foundation principles who also give from the heart, they're not only strategic in the way in which they give. Um, one story that particularly sticks out is of, um, a, a, a president of an organization um, that needed to uh, renovate a space. Um, he came to a family that had supported the institution in the past and asked them for a million dollars to renovate the space. They agreed to give that. And when the space had been complete, the work had been completed, there was a celebration, but the funders refused to attend, not because they were bashful, not because they didn't want to have their name associated with it, but because they really weren't interested in the space they gave to the leader of the institution whom they had confidence in. Uh, and that kind of illustrates uh, the way in which um, the funding continues. It's still person to person in many, many uh, instances, and it has a lot to do with personal trust. On the perhaps more critical side of the story, um, I did hear uh, of cases in which funders attach all kinds of um, stringent restrictions on the way in which their money will be used. Uh, and I'm not only talking about um, that the money needs to support uh, uh, program X, but if you want my money to support program X, you have to let me be the supervisor of that program. Um, in one instance, uh, someone came to a JCC and said, I understand that you want to build a, a new building. Uh, I will contribute a significant amount of, of dollars, again, as a private individual, not a foundation, um, but on the condition that you let me run the entire building project. Uh, and by the time he was finished, um, two boards of that institution had to resign. Uh, the building was never built. Um, and uh, the funder didn't really live up to uh, the, the obligations that he had that he had uh, stated. Um, that, that's an example of that. Perhaps the most dramatic example that I heard was a funder who um, committed to a, um, a gift in the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, and then out of nowhere, he reneged on that pledge. And then a couple of months later, uh, the lawyer for that funder said, okay, he's ready to pay now, without any rhyme or reason really to it. Um, and um, that can drive professionals that, that not, not for profits a bit crazy after all. Um, uh, and then there are other kinds of, uh, of, of, of uh, funders, um, the, uh, individual funder uh, actions that, uh, that are problematic, expecting all kinds of special treatment, um, literally treatment. In one case, I heard about a funder whose wife needed a, 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 a medical procedure um, and uh, stated very clearly that if she was not going to be pushed to the head of the line to get that medical procedure, then uh, the funding would, uh, the funder would not uh, deliver uh, on, his, on his commitment. Um, and, not le and, and last but not least, um, I did hear about cases of the abusive treatment of professionals and not-for-profits by individual funders. 
uh, and by abusive treatment, I'm talking about um, a disrespectful language that was used. Um, uh, a funder, for example, uh, uh, spoke to a professional who said to him, uh, when you visit me in my condo building, you, you use the service entrance, because uh, that's really all you are, a service person. Um, and then in some cases also, questions arose about uh, various types of harassment, uh, funders demanding that an employee be fired for no cause other than the fact that the funder didn't get along with that employee. And yes, there were instances of sexual harassment as well uh, that I heard about. So again, I don't want this to overshadow the overall positive, uh, uh, the, the, the positive comments that were made um, and the gratitude that so many uh, of these uh, professionals expressed, but there are issues. And the question is whether we can, can face up to those issues and find ways to work together um, and bring, if I, I'm referring to two sides of the table, maybe there are more sides than that, bring them together uh, to communicate much more effectively with one another. Because ultimately the point of all this is to develop much more efficiency uh, in the field of, of Jewish philanthropy. Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, you know, you mentioned this earlier when you were, when you were speaking, but um, it was certainly very evident as we were putting together, granted, right? Th these are conversations that are happening all in not, this is, these are not Jewish community or Jewish communal issues only, right? Like this That's is correct. all over the field of philanthropy. Yes. Um, and I would say in the process of developing, granted, um, JFN had a unique opportunity to develop partnerships with other philanthropy serving organizations. And, you know, um, Tamar mentioned there's an event coming up with Exponent Philanthropy. So like there are ways in which the philanthropic community can come together to address this. Um, um, you know, JFN and, and Granted provides a particular Jewish lens and context. But yes. I'm wondering, Jack, just a minute or two about sort of what you learned about what's going on in general philanthropy. And yeah, there, there, there are models out there uh, to address uh, many of these uh, many of these issues. Um, uh, I, I alluded earlier to programs that are run uh, that are designed specifically for younger professionals working at foundations. Um, to help them understand what is their proper role and what may be improper. Um, um, again, this is not unique to the Jewish scene, and that's why it's, it's, uh, these are discussions taking place and, and programs taking place outside. Uh, there are programs that exist to work on the whole issue of overhead, which is, I mentioned is a, a controversial one, um, and to learn from the experiences um, of funders who have in fact supported overhead and why they have done so. Um, there are um, programs to bring together uh, funders and their grantees for um, what is hoped will be much more honest conversations so that the areas of misunderstanding or simply that, uh, that there are different interests involved are surfaced uh, in conversation. And again, I'm not so naive as to think that that's going to resolve everything. Uh, but I think that these are, are steps that have been taken outside of the Jewish arena and will continue uh, to have an impact. Great. So I would just say that granted is looking at those models and trying to both curate, right? And what's whatever it exists, no need to recreate the wheel. But, um, but also sort of translate something through a Jewish lens and sort of Jewish communal lens. So um, I really would encourage everyone to take a look at the site and, and participate in these kind of offerings. Um, so I just, I'm gonna just share um, a few minutes of the recommendations piece of the report um, that, that Jack put together um, and sort of talk you through sort of how we got to them. And, but before I just wanna just, if anyone has any questions, please, I saw Yafa, um, Somebody just put something in the in the in the chat. Um, but if you have any questions, please, um, we're going to have some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so let me just give you a little bit of a, a sense of the the process by which we got to these recommendations. Um, you know, again, I've worked with Jack on many many reports, um, and in most of them, I think in all of them except for this one, Jack is usually the as the outside observer and the researcher is the one to put forward recommendations. Um, we decided this time around that the real, um, the most effective way to put together recommendations to discuss these issues, right, if improving the grant maker grant seeker relationship was to pull together grant makers and grant seekers together to discuss the report 
and to put forward recommendation, share a shared sense, a shared set of recommendations. Um, so what we have here, um, and thank you for, for sharing the slide, we actually have two sets of recommendations. This first slide are what we're calling basic recommendations. Um, and they are basically um, the, what we believe or what the, the committee of grant makers and grant seekers believe are like the basis of all effective relationships. And um, we're also gonna share a set of aspirational uh, recommendations, which will be in the next slide. But let me just um, give you just a little bit of context here. This is all in the report, which is on our website. And I think before we close today, somebody could just put the link up from the website, uh, from uh, JFN's website into the um, chat along with the granted site. Um, so they basically, these recommendations pretty much demonstrate that this is it, like Jack was saying, um, this is two-sided, right? This is not just a grant maker problem. It's not just a grant seeker problem. This is a, it's a, uh, a challenge that faces everyone involved in these relationships. And so we have mutual responsibility for getting this right. Um, and so um, they basically fall in certain categories. One is around building trust and understanding. Um, and if you see here in the, on the slide, you know, there's a whole bunch of things grant makers should be thinking about, grant seekers should be thinking about, and what we should all be thinking about together. Um, so for example, investing time in relationship building that goes beyond the nuts and bolts of grant management, right? Or discussing vision, goals, and core beliefs. Those are things that grant makers and grant seekers should both be doing with each other. Um, grant seekers should be seeking advice, not as a tactic to gain funding, but for learning, right? Recognizing that there is, uh, that, that, the, that advice is, um, comes from expertise and not just because there's funding attached to it. Um, and, uh, you know, seeking input from each other, especially when you're making decisions to do a, you know, pivot, whether it's around strategy or program, um, when a foundation is, you know, thinking differently about its you know, logic model or its theory of change, what are your key, key grant makers? Grant, key grant seekers think about that. Um, I think those are important things to be considering. Um, and then there is the, no, the issue of increasing transparency. Um, Jack shared in some of his stories, you know, grant makers really need to share how grant decisions are made and setting clear expectations about the probability of funding. You know, we're working on this proposal together with you. We think these are the right edits, but we still have to show it to our board and we're not entirely sure how they're gonna land. Um, and grant seekers should be sharing you know, they shouldn't be spinning the story, right? Practice candor, um, help grant makers see how things really are. Um, what does it really take to do business? Um, and what's when things aren't working, um, you know, not to sugarcoat them, but what does that really look like? Um, and then there is improving communications. You know, what does no really mean? Again, as Jack was explaining, and um, is it mean, you know, not yet? Does it mean, you know, let's discuss this, you know, keep me, keep me in the loop and I'll let you know when the time is right. Um, and, um, and both grant makers and grant seekers need to think about, um, you know, sharing information that's clear, jargon free. And the other thing I'll add to that is communication is two-sided, right? It's both people who, those who are communicating and those who are receiving the communication, you know, reading what comes your way, um, asking the right questions, you know, active listening. Those are all parts of building, um, you know, improving those communications. So these all seem fairly elementary, but they really require effort, intention, and intention. And so um, something that we should be thinking about. And if you see on the granted site, you know, we hope to have, again, like, you know, these self-assessment tools and, and other um, opportunities to reflect on where we fall um, in this matrix. Um, okay, and the next slide we're gonna move to is sort of some of the aspirational um, recommendations, you know, so like what if as a field we, right, as Jack said, reframe the overhead conversation? What if as a funding community we committed to more multi year grants, um, right, which allowed for grant seekers to feel more comfortable being more transparent? Um, what if there was a standard set of application evaluation and reporting tools, you know, things that we did see coming out of COVID? Um, can that continue? Um, what have we learned from that process? Is there, you know, what have we lost by doing things? Um, um, in a more standardized way. Um, you know, cultivating understanding and empathy amongst grant makers and grant seekers. You know, also again, the role of foundations in the space, the role of nonprofits, um, developing a set of policies and norms with case studies for illustration. These are things that we try to build on the granted site as well. And then joining forces to continue advancing community conversations around discrimination and sexual harassment. Like, what does that mean? You know, how do we do this together as a field? Um, it's time to, you know, it's already happening, but how do we move this along um, in, in a more intentional um, uh, way? 
Um, and then there, you know, one other thought was that ensuring that those who are making grant making decisions actually have some nonprofit experience so they see what, what it feels like on the other side. Um, so these are just some of the recommendations, you know, the, again, granted is um, going to be working on all of them. Um, and um, yeah, I think we should all just sort of stay um, in the loop. Um, and um, I know I've bookmarked the website and I will keep going back to check on, you know, am I doing this right? How can I do this better? Um, and so um, I guess we could leave this, move this over now to Tamar if you want to manage any Q and A. Great, thank you so much. Um, there's so much information there. I just want to mention that just put that on the website and you can find the full report when you look at, look at the homepage. And we were just reflecting on some of the findings that were on page 48 and 49 and there's so much information there. So I wanna, we have a few questions um, that I want to dive into. So one is, would it be possible to get a sense of what proportion of nonprofits interviewed had issues with foundations is this the exception or the rule? So Jack, do you wanna comment on that? Do you have any, any data points that you wanna share in the Jewish right. world? It's, so, it, it's, hard, it's hard to quantify that way, but we, um, for this project, um, I, over, I, I interviewed, again, with the assistance of a, a person, 140 professionals and not-for-profits um, in something like 40 cities across the United States and Canada. Uh, as well. Uh, and in some cases, in many cases, uh, um, well, in some cases, we interviewed people who are at smaller uh, institutions who really have no dealings uh, with foundations. Um, so I, it's, it's hard really for me to, to quantify in that way. Suffice it to say that the larger institutions, particularly those national in scope, um, did have experiences working with foundations. Um, the, uh, the, the most outspoken people um, who uh, had uh, issues, if you will, that I, I raised uh, were a minority, but they were sig a significant minority. Um, and perhaps more to the point, there were people uh, who were well-established in their fields, had multiple ex experiences working for a number of different organizations and were drawing upon their experiences that they had in those organizations uh, with, uh, with, with foundations. So I, I realize I'm not answering your question, I'm explaining why it's difficult for me to quantify that. Thank you. Another question, um, maybe we'll start with you with this, Dina, and I have a little to add, but how are the findings being communicated with the heads of Jewish foundations? So, so, okay, so, um, when the, the, Jack wrote this report before COVID and the actual plan was for us to release um, the report without a granted program, right? It was to release it at the last year's JFN conference um, in 2020. Um, and with an announcement that we we're planning to create granted. Um, so let's just say that that didn't happen. Um, the conference didn't happen and the environment was really, we felt was really not the right one to focus on what foundations were not doing right, right? Especially as we saw as COVID um, was beginning and progressing and the ways in which funders were really stepping up to help the nonprofit community, the way collaboration, the way certain requirements were being, um, you know, you know, taken away and, um, and, and we seized the opportunity to use the time to see what was happening and to build Granted and then launched it at JFN's conference in 2021. Um, so this is really, even though the report was written before, and I'm sure to Jack Chagrin, it wasn't made much more public until now. Um, now's, now's the time, right? So we launched at conference um, and this whole granted project, right? Is supposed to raise these questions and these issues. Um, and that's how we're hoping to reach out to the heads of Jewish foundations. This is the first session aside from one that we held at the conference, um, which was you know, one of nine options for participants to, you know, to join in on. And um, as Tamar said, there'll be monthly um, conversations and um, you know, we hope to make this um, a real communal conversation. I hope I answered. Yeah, very good, thank you. Jack, do you have anything else to add to that? Of uh, yes, what I'll add to it is that actually at the Jewish Funders Network Conference two years ago, um, there was a, um, a private meeting um, of the CEOs of the largest 
uh, foundations. They they apparently exist as a subgroup uh, within the Jewish Funders Network. Uh, and there must have been 25, 30 people around the table uh, where I gave a, a preliminary presentation uh, of my findings. Uh, this was again, uh, and, and this was designed for me to get some feedback about about the findings and about the, the framing uh, of the paper, uh, of the report before it came out. So uh, they've been aware of this now for over two years uh, and the key issues were put on the table then already. Thank you. And um, like Dina said, and what Jack was also reflecting on is that part of Granted is that we're committed to bringing these conversations to many different places and spaces and the recommendations and thinking very forward focused of the recommendations. So please reach out to me um, or to my other, any other colleagues at JFN that will make sure that the right people get involved to, to create the spaces for the people that we feel should, should would benefit from learning this information, um, the, would get it in front of them in the best way the best way possible to create conversation. And Tamar, may, have, may I just, add, yeah, may I just add one point? And that is sure. that um, um, uh, I think it would be great also if um, Jewish not-for-profit leaders um, uh, would be informed about the existence of this report also, mm -hmm. um, because it, it may reflect some of their own views and experiences, but also it provides some feedback or pushback in some cases that might be beneficial for them as well. So this is not this is not solely for the funder side. Very much so. Thank you for bringing that up. We really are bringing our outreach, and we're working in conjunction with Upstart to make sure that we're creating spaces in their network also, and outreach to their network of nonprofits is for is for funders and grant grant makers and the nonprofits that we're calling grant seekers to really come together as partners uh, to to learn this information and to see how we can create the change we want to see from from these recommendations. And I know we're just at the top of of the hour, and we didn't get to all the all of the questions, but I'll try to get one last one in real quick, is that what are grant seekers ideal proposals or report structures from foundations? And this is way, we need much more time than just 60 seconds, but are any big complaints about certain features or applications on reports? So I thought, I know on one foot, if there's a, if there's a reflection or two that you heard from grant seekers about the structure of reports, like really tangible, like I'm not following reports that are issued by foundations. Yes, that are requested. Ideal proposal or re I'm sorry, that are requested by foundations. Yes, right. Ah, right. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that 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 this will answer the question, but but um, certain, one of the questions, one of the issues that have come up is whether there could be more of a standardized form mm -hmm. uh, for grant proposals, mm -hmm. um, which some foundations uh, in the non-Jewish arena. Uh, in fact, have been developing and, and experimenting with uh, because there's so much um, um, of, uh, tailoring that's going on. And that requires a lot of time on the part of grant seekers uh, who have to tailor each, uh, each proposal and then each report as well. Uh, and so what I've described about the proposals also is true of the reporting mechanisms, that the different expectations that foundation that diff various foundations have um, and that is uh, extremely time consuming um, for the, the grant seekers. And again, if there would be something that would be more, um, more generalized um, and then with some perhaps specific questions added uh, by each foundation that, that are particularly germane, that might reduce the amount of, of time and uh, that, that, need to be, uh, that needs to be invested in, in re responding to to the reporting requirements. Thank you. The, the only thing I'll add is that I do think there are some funders, uh, this is my experience, whose reporting requirements change each year. Um, so, you know, so as you're, you're, you're writing your report for you know one funder and you're writing it and then you know what you think you're gonna expect the next year around and then there's another set of questions. Um, and a lot of them have to do with, you know, a, a foundation or a funder's theory of change. And they want to be sure that the reports align with the, some of those sort of theories. So it's tricky because, you, you know, you sort of need to understand um, from both sides. But 
I think Jack's Jack's point about like something that's very standardized and then something that might be a bit tailored uh, is, is what I would I would be you know what I've been hearing. It would probably go over better. Thank you. Um, and I know we just went a little over time, but I want to thank you, Jack, for the report and for spending your time with us today to share some of the findings and the recommendations. Thank you, Dina, for being a champion of this work and for leading us along this journey from your Avichai days to, to where you are now. So thank you so much for championing this. And um, please stay tuned, everybody, for, for further monthly programs. I'm going to put something, the, a link in the chat to to sign up for next month's monthly program and check out the website and interact with the content and let us know what you want us to dive deeper into because we are really committed to being the, the platform for these conversations and to create, to create the good change that we want to see. So thank you all for participating today. And thank you again, um, Jack and Dina. Have a good day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.